To understand why we want to use gating, you can imagine that we are planning to use a PDA filter when the number of measurements MK is very large. For instance, suppose you have an amazing sensor that detects the objects with a high probability, that has a fairly small clutter intensity, and that has an enormous field of view. Under these conditions, we may expect the PDA filter to perform well, but if the field of view is sufficiently big, we may receive a very large number of clutter detections at every time instance. To implement a PDA filter, we should compute the posterior mean and covariance, which means that we should compute these summations over all measurements, which could be computationally demanding if MK is sufficiently large. However, for the measurements that are far from the predicted measurements, the weights are practically zero, which means that they do not contribute much to the posterior mean and covariance. To save computations, we would like to avoid computing the weights, means, and covariances for the hypotheses that have insignificant weights. Another way to think of this is that we want to ignore measurements that are far from the predicted measurement. Gating is a technique for doing precisely this. It should be noted, though, that gating is a general technique and that it can also be used, for instance, in Gaussian sum filters. The basic idea is to form a gate in the measurement space and pretend that we know that all measurements outside this gate are clutter measurements. In many cases, this can reduce the number of hypotheses considerably. We can form gates in different ways, where axis-aligned rectangular gates are arguably among the simpler alternatives. In this video, we focus on ellipsoidal gates, which are natural under Gaussian assumptions. To motivate why we use ellipsoidal gates, we can look at the unnormalized weights W tilde K for a hypothesis HK in a Gaussian sum filter. The PDA and nearest neighbor equations can be viewed as special cases of this equation. Note that we are considering which measurement associations that can be ignored, and we therefore focus on the case where theta K is greater than zero. When theta K is greater than zero, the unnormalized weight is PD times the predicted likelihood divided by the clutter intensity. If we assume that lambda c is roughly constant, at least locally, we can see that the weight is maximized when the measurement z theta k is equal to the predicted measurement z bar hk minus one, since that maximizes the predicted likelihood. Similarly, if the measurement is far from the predicted measurement, in the sense that this quadratic form is large, the predicted likelihood takes small values since the quadratic form appears in the negative exponent inside the expression for the above Gaussian density. This implies that the weight W tilde is also small. We refer to the value of this quadratic form as the squared distance and denote it as d square with sub indices hk minus 1 theta k, since hk minus 1 determines the predicted measurement distribution and theta k determines the new measurement. Since the weights shrink with this distance, we say that the measurement is clutter if the distance d square is larger than a threshold g. You can think of this as a pruning technique that prunes hypotheses without ever computing the specific weights. In this example, we have received seven measurements at time k, and we have two predicted hypotheses. The gates for the two hypotheses are illustrated using the two ellipsoids. The predicted measurement and gate for the first hypothesis is illustrated in blue, and the only measurement inside that gate is ZK4. That is, under that hypothesis, we disregard all other measurements as clutter. The gate for the second hypothesis is illustrated using a green point-dashed ellipsoid, and the only measurements inside that gate is ZK4 and ZK6. This example illustrates what the gates might look like in 2D, but gating is of course more important in scenarios where we receive many more measurements. In order for gating to work well, we need to select an appropriate threshold G. To some extent, you can think of that as selecting the size of the ellipsoids. If the threshold G is too large, we might accept too many measurements. On the other hand, if the gate is too small, we increase the probability that the object detection is outside the gate. A common strategy for selecting the threshold is to select it such that the probability that the object detection is outside the gate is sufficiently small. We introduce a parameter PG as the probability that the object measurement is outside the gate, given a predicted hypothesis, HK minus one, and an association hypothesis, theta K, where theta K is greater than zero. That is, when we compute PG, 
we assume that measurement number theta k is the object measurement. Stating that the measurement z theta k is outside the gate for hypothesis hk minus 1 is the same as saying that the distance d squared of hk minus 1 theta k is larger than the threshold g. Given hk minus 1 and theta k, one can show that the distance d squared is chi square distributed with nz degrees of freedom, where nz is the dimensionality of the measurement vector. Interestingly, because of how d squared is defined, this distribution does not depend on the distribution of the predicted measurements, such as the covariance s. Now, since the distance d squared has a simple distribution, we can compute the probability pg as a function of the threshold g, and we do this using the cumulative distribution. To select the threshold g, a common strategy is to select a value for pg, say 0.995, and then use the cumulative distribution for the chi-square distribution to find g. To summarize, gating is a technique to disregard measurements as clutter, without ever computing the weights. Most of the algorithms that we present later start every update with gating to reduce the computational complexity. We have seen that the ellipsoidal gate, where we place a threshold and the distance d square, is a natural choice in Gaussian settings. It's important to select a suitable threshold g, and we typically do this by selecting a value for the probability pg, and then compute the value of g that gives the desired value for pg.